There we go. All right. Uh, lesson number four on stripping stress of its destructive power. Let's just review some principles that we have covered the last week or so. First of all, the operating definition that we are using for this study is this. Stress is the feeling I have towards situations that appear to be overwhelming in my judgment. Now, last week we spent time looking at some of the uh, key words in that definition. Uh, I think this is a good definition for us to get our minds wrapped around what stress is and what it tries to do. We also talked about four essential theological principles uh, in regard to stress. The first is to have a right understanding of God. This is called theology proper. And then to have the right understanding about man. I'm sorry about that typo. My secretary did not catch that. The right understanding of man, that's anthropology. And then the right, boy, oh boy, my secretary did a lousy job here. The right understanding of salvation, that is soteriology. And then the right understanding of walking in the spirit, that is pneumatology. And we discussed this in fairly detail last week. So let's move on this morning or this evening and let's understand this statement here. The theological remedy for stress is available by understanding the Bible's instruction on the concepts of rest and peace. Let me say that again, because for the next week or two, this is where we are going to be camping at. The theological remedy for stress is available by understanding the Bible's instruction on the concepts of rest and peace. These appear to be synonymous terms. However, the scripture teaches them differently, yet they work together. And the reason I worded it, the theological remedy, is because without those four essential theological principles we studied about last week, the only thing I would be offering you would be what psychologists or by what uh, motivational speakers would give you about how to have rest and how to have peace. I'm greatly disturbed by things that Joel Olstein are doing and some of the other quote unquote televangelists. Um, and to see the huge crowds that seem to be under their spell um, is frightening. Um, we must stick to what the Bible has to say. Uh, he's a great motivational speaker. He takes some biblical principles and puts them in more of a contemporary approach. However, apart from the theology, all you have is human inspiration. That's all you have. So let's begin to talk about the biblical concept of rest. And I'm going to give you oh, eight or nine passages of scripture that talk about the concept of rest, although they are related a lot to Judah and Israel. I want you to grasp that it is available to us and who is offering this rest. First of all, God says he gives you rest. Now, notice I've underlined some words. He gives you rest. This is in Exodus 33, verse 14, Matthew 11, 28. We're not going to look at these passages of Scripture. I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover. You can look this up on your own. But I want you to see he gives you rest. Then God has given you rest. There is a difference. There is a difference. One is present. One is past tense. 
he has given you rest. Joshua 22, verse 4. And then the Lord has given rest. Joshua 23, verse 1. You might say, Rick, you're splitting hairs. No, I'm simply doing a word study on rest. And this, this is the word. Rest is related to the Lord. And this would be Jehovah. And to God, Elohim, he gives rest. He has given rest. And Jehovah has given rest. And then God promises rest on every side. Joshua 21, verse 44, would be a passage of scripture. Another one that you might consult is 1 Chronicles 22, verse 18. God promises rest on every side. Now, yes, he's talking to Judah and to Israel, but the principle we can draw for ourselves that he promises to give us rest on every side. And we will get to that in a few mo moments when we dive into Matthew and the book of Hebrews. And then the Bible says, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a complete rest. There is a complete rest. Exodus 31, <coughs> excuse me, verse 15. And then the Bible says there is a <clears throat> solemn rest. A solemn rest, Leviticus 16, verse 31. <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> now, it would behoove us if we had the time to take a look at those verses <coughs> in the context of what was going on when it was recorded that God was going to give them complete rest or God was going to give them a solemn rest. There is a historical context that is there. And then the Bible says you must enter into his rest. Hebrews chapter 4, 1 through 12, that we will take a look at here in a few minutes. And we will discover in that passage that there were some who did not enter into his promised rest and we will discover why. And then the Bible says that some who found no rest, some who found no rest, Deuteronomy 28, verse 65, and Jeremiah 45, verse 3. And then the Bible says that there are some who find no rest. So past tense and present tense. The Israelites did not find, found rest because of their disobedience. And as the writer of Hebrews is writing to those Christians, he says, there are some of you who find no rest now. Rest is a ongoing pursuit through faith and obedience. There is a permanent rest that the believer has in his relationship with God through Christ that is salvation, cannot be taken away. But there is a rest that you and I must pursue by faith and obedience. We must believe what God's word has to say and we must do what God's word has to say in order to maintain that rest. The rest is the rest is secure. It is out there. It is available. It is our decision to enter in to that rest. Now, let's take a look at the Gospel of Matthew. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, if you have your Bibles there. <clears throat> Let's kind of pull this apart a little bit and take a look at what Jesus is saying to those who are listening to him and to the disciples and to us today. This passage is for us today. We are living in a world of unrest. We are living in a world 
that there is such hatred for one another if we don't agree with one another. And that turns into violence and it polarizes relationships. Now, the Jews understood that. Those who were listening to Jesus understood the conflict because they lived underneath Roman persecution. They lived in light of their religious leaders' persecution, if you please. And that's I'm, I'm struggling for a word here. They lived in light of their religious leaders' condescending attitude. If they didn't do things exactly like the religious leaders said they should. And you remember a very clear example where some of the leaders came to Jesus and wanted to know why his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. Well, they did wash their hands, but not the way the legalism of the Pharisees taught. And so they didn't wash their hands the right way. And so the typical Jew who was searching for peace and rest was not going to find it from the Roman Empire, was not going to find it from the religious leaders that they looked to who would tell them the word of God from the Torah about how to have rest. But Jesus was a teacher beyond all teachers, and everybody recognized that he taught as no other prophet taught before, and they flocked to him. And here he says, I'm going to tell you how to have rest. So Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. The first thing you and I should notice about the text is the invitation, the word come. Now, you and I both know invitations can be accepted or rejected. We can accept Christ's invitation to come to him to find rest, no matter how ridiculous the means of finding rest may be to our way of thinking. Did you get that? Sometimes God says, this is the way I want you to have rest. And in our human processing, our deductive reasoning, our logical approach to life, it doesn't make a hoop and a holler bit of sense. And we can reject his invitation to rest. Now, rest begins when you and I come, when we accept the invitation. To accept the invitation means to come to the point a believing in such a way as to demonstrate our submission to his lordship. We have to come to a point and believe that what he says is the only way to rest, and we must demonstrate it by submitting to his lordship. There are some in the past. Now, I haven't heard much about it in the last decade or so. It was a big squabble 15, 20 years ago. But the Lordship of Christ, make Christ Lord of your life. Beloved, when you accept that Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were placed into a school of learning as a disciple. Now you can choose to learn or you can choose to not learn. That's up to us, right? The Lordship of Christ is already in your life. You recognize it when the Spirit of God says, Rick, what you're doing here is not pleasing to the Lord. Rick, your attitude, Rick this, Rick that. And when that is acknowledged by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit using the word of God, 
and I say, God, you're right, I'm wrong. In that area of my life, listen to me, in that area of my life, I acknowledge his lordship already. Because he is already Lord of your life. You do not make him Lord of your life. You submit to him. Now, the invitation is given to those who are described as weary and heavy laden. Now, if you put the two words together, you get the idea of stress. Weary is the internal exhaustion, and heavy laden is the external exhaustion. And we learned two weeks ago that stress affects both the, both the inward and the outward man in a variety of different ways, depending on your personality and approach to life. So Jesus is saying, you folks under such extreme stress, inwardly and outwardly, come, come, accept my invitation, and you can find rest. Now, Jesus uses a very unusual picture for rest. It's something that was very familiar to the Jews, not always welcomed, but they understood it. He pictures rest as a yoke, Y-O-K-E, yoke. Now, the yoke was a hand-carved, upside-down U-shape that was attached to a long pole and it was designed to unite the efforts of two animals in a common goal. And the Bible strictly prohibited the union of a donkey with an ox, according to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. Why was this law put there? The law was for the protection of the weaker animal. Now, the concept of yoke was used by Paul, forbidding the union of a believer with an unbeliever in marriage. Don't be unequally yoked, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Why? It would be destructive to one mate or the other. Now, a Bible dictionary suggests that Jesus, when he talks about the yoke, is not referring to that piece that was placed on the animals, but what a porter wore, P-O-R-T-E-R, a porter wore. When the load was humanly impossible, the yoke helped the porter to support and transport the load. Kind of like a really elaborate hiking backpack where you could really load it up, but it was designed in such a way to help support the load. Now, Jesus says, my yoke is much different than what the porter would use. He describes his yoke as what? Easy and light. Many view the biblical injunctions for handling life as unrealistic. It's out of touch and impractical. But this passage says that any other way of handling stress will only continue or increase the stress. Let me say that again. Any other way of handling stress other than Christ's yoke, which is light and easy, that stress will remain in a person's life and even at times become more severe. Let me give you an example. This is an example. I am being considered for a promotion. It creates stress. The person thinks to himself, am I qualified? Will they think I'm qualified? What if I muff the interview? I don't have a master's degree. 
this person begins to jockey around for favor and recognition when this person should allow the Lord to exalt him in due time as he continues to humbly serve his employer as unto the Lord. There's the difference. There's the difference. There is something built inside of us called a sin nature. And it manifests itself in a variety of different ways. And when there is an opportunity presented before us, stress sometimes will distort our perception and cause us to begin to ask unjustified questions about the situation. And in particular, the unjustified questions that we ask will be about our character and our qualifications and who am I? And you get into this, woe is me, Eeyore mentality. Or on the other hand, it could be spun to where you're walking around like a rooster. Wow, look at me. They're considering me. I'm better than Joe, Sam, and Harry over here. But you know what? At the heart of all of that, it's not the gentleness of the Lord that is speaking. It is the pride of the person. Now listen, if Jesus' way is superior, then how do I enter his yoke? How do I draw from his strength? And he tells us we are to take his yoke. We are to believe that any other way of handling stress remains harmful and destructive. You know what? That That's hard for all of us. We're the type of human beings that we just want to dig in with our macho attitude and we can handle this. We are, and you might even put it in a religious guise. Me and the Lord can handle this. But notice who came first, me and then the Lord. We have to acknowledge, we must admit, and this would be an act of submission and humility. I can't handle this stress. It is beyond me. I can temporarily get by with gimmicks, but you know what? That stress is still going to be there. I must understand that any other method of handling the pressures of my life, apart from the easy and gentle yoke of Jesus, will be ultimately harmful. They will remain hidden from view only to rise up again when other stress points occur. To take something means I must lay something down. I lay down the humanistic, materialistic, the hedonistic ways of handling stress for the gentle, light, and easy ways of our Lord. Jesus also says, once we take his yoke, we enter into a discipleship relationship. He says we are to learn of him. He's the teacher. I'm the student. The student doesn't challenge the teacher. The student understands the teacher has far superior answers. And the student must demonstrate an eagerness to learn. That is very, very important. And why? Why can I believe that Jesus is a better teacher about stress and how to enter into the rest that he promises us? Just examine his life on planet Earth. Did he have stress? Did he have external pressures? Did he have internal pressures? He most certainly did, but he never caved in to them. I taught at Moody Bible Institute for about six years in the evening school program, and I delighted to teach the adult men and women who came at night to study. Most of them worked 40, 50 hours a week, but they faithfully showed up to the classes 
that I taught. And I was so blessed to be able to have an influence primarily in the African-American community. They asked me to teach an evening class to day school students. These are people who were enrolled full time as a day school student, but for some reason, they were locked out of an essential class that they needed for graduation or to go on to the next level. I'll tell you what, those were the most difficult students to teach. They were argumentative. They deemed that they knew more than the professors. And I wasn't the only one that they seemed to enjoy sparring with. I only taught the adult students one, excuse me, the full-time day school students one time. I found the hearts open of the adult learners instead. Jesus expects you and I to learn, to yield, and to obey. This is what keeps me in his yoke. This relationship is my strength and power, so I am not overwhelmed or hurt by the destructive forces of stress. Now, the text says that when I do this, I will find rest and I will have rest. Now, notice first the promise of rest. This is the incentive, beloved. Can any other stress management techniques that you know of or that you have practiced promise complete rest? And the answer is a resounding no. But Christ invites you and I and offers this rest. He promises when I follow through, I will have this rest. Some Christians try God. And when they do not experience the promised results, you know what they do? They blame God. God failed me. I did what he said. Oh, really? <laughs> we can get into another whole series on partial obedience versus full obedience. Had Joshua and the Israelites not walked around Jericho seven days, as Jehovah prescribed to them. They only did it five times. If they never blew the horns, the walls would never come down. Hebrews chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, turn to there, the verse 11 verses. This passage is talking about rest. Perhaps we should stop and consider this word specifically and not in general. Could you define rest to a fourth grader? Are you smarter than a sixth grader? Rest means a cessation from ag activity, from striving towards or against something, to stop my laborious efforts. It means to cease from self-efforts. It means the end of trying to deal with stress through my feeble and fleshly works. It means freedom, freedom from easily being annoyed or bothered by things outside of my control. It also means stability, security, fixed, unmovable. My first observation is that there is a promise of rest. Again, rest is available. There is hope in finding rest and there is a limitation and qualification for this rest. Failure to seize the moment by proper means results in falling short of the immense benefits rest provides. The writer appeals to the urgency and seriousness of this rest when he uses the word fear. He fears that someone would not enter this rest. Now, the writer makes reference to the days of Moses and Joshua. Like them, he says, we have had good news preached to us. This good news of rest is both soteriological and sanctification. In other words, it's both 
salvation, and holiness. The good news preached to us first came by the Lord Jesus Christ and then was carried down by the apostles. Moses and Joshua preached the good news of a land flowing with milk and honey, a land God promised to Abraham and reiterated to Isaac, Jacob, and to Moses. But why was it that when you read in Judges, the sons of Israel are not free. They're captives because they failed to obey God in driving out the inhabitants of the land. The writer says they heard, now watch this, they did not unite what they heard with faith. When you and I do not believe you and I fail to act. When you fail to act, you and I forfeit the divine blessings promised. James puts it this way, that we are not only to be hearers of the word, but doers also. Hearing the word of God without doing what the word of God says will make you a spiritual intellect. And I want you on my team on New Year's Eve when we have Bible trivia. However, if you act on what you hear, you will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to be able to stand against all the fiery darts that the evil one will send against you. And you will know what one of the major tools that the enemy uses to trip you up? It's called stress. It's called stress. If the enemy can get your eyes off of the Lord and have your eyes fixed upon the Goliath that you are facing, half the battle is won. Those who did not enter the promised rest were disobedient, the scripture said. But the disobedient, now watch this, could not nullify the offer of rest to others who would choose to obey. So in other words, here you are talking to people and you're trying to encourage them and you're giving them the scriptures about how to enter into the rest that God promises for them in whatever situation they're finding themselves in. You're giving good scripture and they refuse to act upon it. In fact, they come back, come back and complain to you that it doesn't work. Don't let their disbelief, listen to this, don't let their disbelief rob you of your faith and obedience. You and I must stand strong in what God's word has to say, regardless of what is going around us. You know what I think about? I think of Joshua and Caleb. You remember they went out and spied out the land. God said, I've already, I've already given it to you. I've already given it to you. You're going to occupy houses you did not build. You're going to have vineyards you did not plant. I've given it to you. And they went out. Forty days, they spied out the land. They even came back loaded down with all of the rewards of the land. And what do you find? You have these two young men, Joshua and Caleb, standing against the other 10 spies who went out and saw the same thing, heard the same thing that those two men heard and said, we can't do it. We're grasshoppers in their sight. And they stood against the entire nation and said, don't you remember God said he has given us to the land? Let's go in. No, no, we can't do it. And so they wandered, didn't they? And the result was what? Death for everybody 20 and above. Now, the text is one of urgency to enter into the rest. And 
the word today is used. Joshua's rest was temporarily enjoyed or forfeited by the obedience or lack thereof of the sons of Israel. You see, those 10 men influenced the entire nation to where Joshua and Caleb's rest was temporarily suspended because of their disbelief. Do you ever think about that? Yeah, it was. Did Joshua and Caleb go into the land? No. They had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and watch grandma and grandpa, aunt and uncle, maybe brothers and sisters, neighbors, fall over dead in the desert because of their disbelief. That had to be painful. A 40-year funeral march. They didn't enter their rest until all of that punishment by God had been fulfilled. They lead the second generation into the land. They conquer, they divide the land. And you know the first words out of Caleb's mouth after they settle the land? You know what he tells Joshua? He tells Joshua, I want the most difficult place there is as my reward, and he pointed towards the hills. He says, I want that piece of land. The disbelief, listen to me, the disbelief of other people can impact you if you allow it to. If you allow it to. We are reminded that to remain in God's rest is a matter of individual personal diligence. Avoiding the snares and entrapment of stress and its destructive power in our lives is our choice. We either believe or we don't believe. We either act and remain in the rest or we reject and lose the rest. Failure to obey hinders my full and complete rest on all sides. The psalmist said, even my enemies will be at peace with me, and he was a refugee at the time. You're either up on Jesus and he is a wonderful, glorious person, or you're down on spiritual things and they don't work, and what's the use? It's a matter of your perspective. Is your perspective horizontal or is it vertical? Is it upward or is it outward? That's the key for all of us to have to answer. Now, I want to summarize the two passages for you. I should have put that up there. We did look at Hebrews. Let's summarize Matthew and Hebrews together, okay? You got some fill in the blanks there, all right? I must hear and receive God's invitation to come. What does that mean? That means I must humble, be humble, and deal with my pride. A proud person is not going to reach out and ask for help. Proverbs is loaded with the proud who does not ask for help. And destruction comes to someone with a haughty spirit and with pride. I must recognize that stress is trying to ruin my insides and my outsides. Not only is there external pressure deadlines, people's critical spirits, etc. But there is internal reactions such as fear, worry, and anxiety. I must acknowledge that his yoke is not harmful. His ways are superior to any thoughts of stress management that I might have or that I might hear of. Listen to me. There is such a deluge of things that are being written and printed today. The small majority of them are good. The vast majority of them are humanism cloaked behind spirituality. I'm here to tell you, beloved, none of those authors or books 
can give you the rest that is found in your relationship with Jesus Christ and maintained through your obedience to Jesus Christ. I must believe that he is offering an authentic promise of rest only he can fulfill. There's not a bait and switch here. There will not be a disappointment. You know how many times the psalmist in Psalm 119 reminds God that he's placing his faith in God and please don't let me be disappointed? God will not disappoint us. Man will, but God will not. I must be willing to become a student, not the teacher. I must exchange my sinful patterns of thinking for his righteous, simple, humble ways of dealing with stress. I must become a student. I need to come open-handed before the throne of grace. And when I kneel down in humility and brokenness, my hands are open, my mouth is shut, and I wait upon the Lord to direct my steps. And then I must act upon what I hear. I have to unite faith to my hearing. I must be a doer of the word and not merely a hearer only. And I must reject others' experiences and realize that though they did not find rest, I can. Their experience only validates the truth that they lived by sight and in disobedience. I tried it your way. I didn't have any more peace or rest this week than I did the week before. So I'm sorry, this just doesn't work. What does that tell you about that person? It tells you that this person entered into this with a preconceived, preconceived idea that at a certain time, God must act this way. Remember what we talked about this morning in church. Your spiritual resume cannot be used to get God to do what you want him to do. And then I must understand that any other means of stripping stress of its destructive power is temporary. God promises, God's promise of rest is permanent and lasting in and through and for any and all stresses of life. His principles are universal and timeless. I must commit myself to working hard at keeping this rest. Although it has been provided and it remains, I must, I must be diligent to practice its principles. I must control my emotions to changeless or changing circumstances and people by faith in and obedience to his word regardless. So the question is, how serious are you about wanting God's rest? How serious are we about wanting God's rest? If the Christian life and all of the benefits would remove all of the difficulties in life from the point that we got saved until the point we die or were translated, a good portion of your Bible and mine would not be needed, especially when it came down to the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. Why do we have the armor of God? The armor of God is to protect us from the assaults of the evil one that seeks to disrupt us and disturb us and to create stressful situations. 
You must fight hard to maintain your rest. Don't take it for granted. Guard it with all of the spiritual strength, the faith, and the obedience that the Spirit of God will give you. Remember, you are more than conquerors through him who loved you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Nothing is impossible with God. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? 